Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. And it's time for uh, an interesting little uh, list video that we're about to embark on. I've, I've been at this whole reviewing thing for a long time, and over the course of the almost 10 years that I've been running this YouTube channel, I, I have reviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of albums, maybe even thousands at, at this point. But even though I managed to keep pretty busy on this channel, unfortunately I cannot and I do not cover everything. There's only so much time in the day, I only have two ears, and uh, only so much brain capacity. So as a result, some records don't get covered, some records fall to the wayside. Others I just kind of wrestle with until I just forget to do any kind of coverage of them whatsoever. Uh, which is why I have come through with, with this list. 15 projects that I, I wish I reviewed at some point. Now, keep in mind, this list is not to say that these albums have become my favorites, that they've grown on me. For some of these albums, that is the case. But for the most part, I think each of these records represents an interesting part in the musical underground or mainstream uh, that I simply wish I put in my two cents, and that's all. So, let's go. Yes, first, James Ferraro's Far Side Virtual. While this is not a perfect record, I still think it's a pretty significant moment for electronic music, for internet music, in a way for vaporwave aesthetics. Sure, I suppose one could call this album gimmicky, but it still remains that this record is a fantastic attempt at trying to take the the vibe, the aesthetics, the sound of what was Muzak for a certain time in, in commercial culture. This technological time in the late 90s and the early 2000s when gateway computers and CD-ROMs were like the wave of the future. Taking that clunky, dated, MIDI electronic sound and then trying to transfer that over into some legitimately interesting instrumental compositions is an idea I completely fuck with. And one that I think I appreciate a little bit now more than I did upon the album's initial release. Sure, you could say that James has come out with deeper and more significant projects since then, ones that don't necessarily center around a single or surface level idea, NYC Hell is certainly an example of that. But as the dust is settling on Ferraro's growing discography, Farside still stands as one of the more interesting detours in his canon. So I guess give this album a shot. If you'd like to hear electronic music that sounds like the soundtrack to an alternate reality where technology is improving our lives instead of destroying it. The next record that I wish I covered the year it came out is the 2010 Death Spell Omega album, Paracletus. Death Spell Omega, if you're unaware, is a metal band from France that for a long time has been fusing elements of death metal, black metal, avant-garde metal, and progressive metal into this dense, winding, layered, intricate, and tangled web. The band has been at it since the very late 90s, and Paracletus is pretty much a crown jewel in the band's discography, one of the highest points of their entire canon. And even though in 2010 I did have an appreciation for at least some of those genres and extreme metal in general, sometimes the more progressive and avant-garde stuff does fail to land with me. There are competing bands whose records I covered that gave me a bit more of an appreciation for the style. I went on to appreciate the following EPs that Despel dropped, like uh, Diabolus Absconditus and also uh, Drought. Listening to the band's following releases and having to go back and try their old stuff just gave me I guess just more familiarity and allowed me to untangle the very difficult web that Paracletus presents. Unfortunately, there were just a lot of factors working against my timely enjoyment of the album. Being distracted by other albums, needing the time to properly process what the band was doing, which I most likely would have been able to do faster had I been more familiar with the band's previous material, but, you know, that's kind of the thing with the needle drop. I didn't go into this with all the music knowledge in the world. A lot of the time, I'm kind of learning as I'm going along. And unfortunately, as a result of that, there are some reviews that uh, I kind of miss out on and I wish I did, but that's the point of this video, isn't it? You know, I have to give a shout out to Waka Flocka Flames Flocka Veli. I really do. I wish I covered in depth this album at the time. It's crazy to think about this album now in 2018 because of how unique it was at the time. The reception 
of the record, which of course this album had bangers on it. Of course this album had fans, but a lot of rap fans hated this record. They thought the production was annoying. They thought Waka Flocka Flames lyrics were dumb, that he couldn't rap, that his whole delivery was just a gimmick, just a shtick, just trash, that there was no hope and there was no future for this dude. And maybe in some respects, the critics of this album and Waka in general were correct because, hey, you know, while he does still drop some decent music, uh, it, for the most part, it seems like Waka's time in the limelight is pretty much up, unfortunately. But the spark that Waka and Lex Luger created together on this album, the cultural, the musical spark they ignited on this record, would go on to influence a whole new generation of trap music. Now, of course, this album is not the first trap album. I wouldn't even argue that it's the biggest trap album, but this album elevated in a huge way a once purely Southern and a pretty underground sound. And I unfortunately was like a lot of people reacting negatively to this album, reacting to essentially the lowered bar of lyricism portrayed on this record, just how redundant a lot of the production was. And as an album experience, it is kind of one dimensional. But if you completely erase this album from the history books, I don't really know if you get the same shape of hip hop today because how many of the current crop of SoundCloud rappers are greatly influenced by Chief Keef, who before that was inspired by Waka Flocka. Now, of course, Waka was not the only artist that Chief Keef was listening to, and without Gucci Mane putting him on, I don't even really know where Waka's career would be. So we can't really look at Flockavelli as some kind of inception point of trap music. We can't look at it purely in a vacuum. I still think this album, though, is a foundational block in a lot of the current trends we see in hip hop music. And as a result, at the time, I just wish I covered it, and, and maybe in covering it had the foresight to see uh, the ripples of influence it would have. Next album on my list is Little Ugly Mane's Mr. Thug Isolation, which is an album that maybe a year after not covering it, after it had been released, uh, I, I kind of immediately uh, regretted not doing so. Because in retrospect, I see the album as a pretty significant moment for internet hip hop, where around the time this album was released, it was kind of this new trend to be a rapper that kind of solely thrived off of the internet, had mostly just an internet-based audience, not necessarily climbing your way up the ladder purely through whatever local scene you happen to be born into. And even though I did go on to enjoy quite a bit of Little Ugly Mane's later material, again, I do wish I covered uh, this album, not only because of, of what it represented for music culture as a whole, but also uh, because of the the dark, twisted pathways that Ugly Mane sort of takes uh, trap and southern hip-hop through on this album. At the time, I felt like the record was a little gimmicky, and, and maybe I still feel that way to a degree because of the uh, down-pitched vocals and how kind of goofy and cartoony some of the tracks sound as a result of it. Still, though, there's no taking away from the dark lyricism and production all over this release, and also the incredible amount of influence that this album went on to have on SoundCloud rappers, on artists who are trying to revive this super old-school dark, kind of satanic 3-6 Mafia style Memphis rap sound, but updating it for the millennial or band camp rap generation. So certainly one of the more interesting hip hop releases of the decade, just, just wish I covered it. This next release that I wish I covered at the time is the Grouper AIA Alien Observer double album. Liz Harris is a singer-songwriter, a multi-instrumentalist who has been recording music under the Grouper name for a long time. She has covered a multitude of bases across her discography so far. And truth be told, her records are a little hit or miss for me. I'm not crazy about a lot of the material that she drops. As a result of that, I think I went into this new album over here with my guard up higher than it most likely should have been. The length of this project, the amount of material she handed over to fans on this thing might have made me a little skeptical at the time too. Not to mention that the recording on this album is pretty lo-fi, a little abrasive to the point where it, it does kind of uh, 
uh, prickle at my eardrums a bit in a slightly painful way. I sound like I'm almost trying to scare you off of the album, but I promise you I'm not because I actually think this record, after taking the time to fully process it and appreciate what Liz was doing on this album, uh, I think this record's great. Easily one of the best ambient and drone albums of this decade. Unfortunately, it took me a while to come to that conclusion, but uh, the amazing and distorted and tattered soundscapes that Liz pulls together on this record, along with her disembodied alien ghostly vocals, uh, work together in an incredibly hypnotic, surreal, and uh, unsettling fashion. Give it a shot yourself, give it an open mind, uh, recommend it, and uh, again, regretful that I did not cover it at the time that it was uh, originally released. <laughs> Next, I would like to talk about the Mark Kozlik and Jimmy Laval album, Perils from the Sea. As a lot of you following the channel may know, uh, we do quite a bit of coverage of the Kaz around here. Maybe not every album he releases because he is quite prolific these days and I do try to cover all of the major stuff. I, like many other publications, celebrated Mark's 2014 release, Benji, an amazing album that was essentially a third wind in the singer-songwriter's long-spanning career from uh, his own solo stuff to Sun Kill Moon material to, uh, uh, of course, Red House Painters. And even though Benji is a fantastic record, certainly deserved the widespread acclaim that it received, truth be told, the material on that album isn't really that much different than a lot of the stuff Mark was recording up until that point. I mean, of course, his uh, uh, stuff was still very folky, still very uh, narrative and conversational. Certainly, he hit upon a perfect balance of storytelling and balladry on Benji that maybe previous albums didn't quite figure out yet. And Perils from the Sea, unfortunately, is one of those albums that I think has been lost in the general lack of appreciation for Mark's material pre-Benji. This thing came out just a year before Benji. I didn't cover it because I don't even think I knew it existed. And it's pretty much one of the best Folktronica albums ever. The glistening, gorgeous, and glossy electronics that Jimmy brings to the table uh, make for an excellent setting. Uh, when it comes to Mark's storytelling. I don't really have anything else to say about the album other than I, I just wish I listened to it or I was aware of it at the time had I had the ability to uh, hear it and give it the appreciation it deserves. It easily would have been one of my favorite records of the year. So uh, uh, yeah, but uh, at least I can listen to it and appreciate it and, uh, and, and promote it now. So there you go. <laughs> Next, I want to shout out the Leonard Cohen album, You Want It Darker. I was aware of this record at the time of its release. I did talk about it in a Why You Know review. I did listen to it. I wasn't too crazy about it. I've come to appreciate the album a little bit more in retrospect, as I've really only been a fan of Leonard Cohen's classic material up until this point. His gravelly voice, his thoughtful poetry, the background singers, the obviously dark uh, instrumentals on this thing have all slowly added up for me over time. It's also tragic that we've lost Leonard Cohen since the release of this album, though I, I suppose he did end on a high note with this record. Between the album growing on me and just the loss of Leonard Cohen in general, I just wish I covered this record in full and gave it the, uh, the full review that it obviously deserved. <laughs> Next, I want to shout out the Father John Misty album, Fear Fun. Uh, yeah, just wasn't too crazy about this album upon release. I thought it was an okay singer-songwriter record with some pretty grand reverby instrumentation here and there, though not nearly as uh, epic as what Josh would later deliver on I Love You Honey Bear. I did recognize his very sharp sense of humor, his wit on this album, though I don't think it was quite as bold as what he would display on subsequent albums. While Fear Fun is still not one of my favorite Father John Misty albums, uh, I just wish I covered it. Next, the Bell Witch album Mirror Reaper that dropped uh, in 2017. Yeah, I, I wish I covered this record, and I'm not even sure if I went through the entire thing, would the review be super positive or super negative, but Bell Witch is one of these slower, more patient, doomier, more atmospheric metal bands that uh, really kind of takes their time uh, with their work, and they have kind of a unique approach to the genre on this new record over here, as they seem to be fusing it with the slowcore genre, which is not really anything that I've heard a whole lot of doom metal bands do. Unfortunately, though, at the time, I think I was just a little too slammed to even slow my own brain down and appreciate 
uh, the, the subtleties of what this album had to offer. As I felt like I couldn't even get enough of a sense of it to truly even uh, boil my thoughts down into a Why You Know review segment effectively. I definitely see the album as one of the more unique records in the metal underground this decade. I just wish that I took the time to slow things down and appreciate the album for that in a full-length review. <laughs> This record is an incredibly colorful and uh, insane, totally off-the-wall black metal album. Pest Noir is a French black metal project, and this is easily uh, one of the band's best albums to date. It is an insane, multifaceted, offensive, nasty, uh, gross, and creatively uh, composed uh, record. With not only harsh and fantastic passages of raw black metal, but also uh, some <laughs> interesting uh, bits of, of French music and folk music uh, worked into uh, uh, the, the album's repertoire too. It's maybe one of the most versatile and theatrical black metal albums that I've ever heard. At the time, I didn't end up covering the record, and I did do a video talking about how I took somewhat of an issue with the uh, album's messages of, of nationalism and some of the more gruesome lyrical bits of the record, but in retrospect, I, I just wish I said fuck it and just covered the album. <laughs> Next, Tracksman to Mind of Tracksman, which uh, is an electronic music record, one of the albums that uh, got quite a bit of attention in, at the time, what was a somewhat short-lived resurgence of footwork music on the internet. Of course, the scene and the genre is still thriving in the niche that it came out of. This rhythmically intense and intricate electronic music genre was uh, getting an interesting breath of life. Uh, thanks to records and artists like this. Sure, the record is pretty long-winded, and footwork is a very, very, very specific genre, so don't be surprised going into this album if you feel like a lot of the songs kind of groove and vibe the same way. I also feel like the aesthetic of footwork music, the constantly tapping snare drums, the off-kilter kicks, the persistent vocal samples, it's not gonna be for everybody. It really, truly isn't. While footwork isn't as bombastic and as annoying and uh, as, as gimmicky as like a, a mainstream EDM song, uh, there are difficult challenges with listening to it in that it, in the moment it can feel like trying to pull off a super complex mathematical equation just off the cuff without a calculator. It really is that intense and even though maybe listening to this album from front to back is is not one of the most enjoyable experiences uh, that I've had this decade. Uh, there are still few genres of electronic music and records like Tracks Man that still stick out in my mind as like, yeah, that's, that's a really unique sound. That's a really kind of special sound that I wish I covered and kind of had put my thoughts out on uh, in a full-length review. And uh, the next album I'll talk about in this video is, is pretty much DJ Rashad's uh, Rest in Peace, uh, Double Cup record, who is another artist, another producer in the uh, footwork scene, or was, uh, rather, and I regret not covering that record for pretty much the same reasons. Next, I want to say that I regret not covering Little B's God's Father mixtape, which uh, it took me a little while to realize it after listening to a great deal of his discography uh, and kind of comparing it. Uh, but this is easily Little B's best mixtape. I think it's his best mixtape. It's my favorite Little B mixtape. The production on this thing is epic. Uh, most of his bars and performances on this thing are great too. A lot of the Base God's mixtape discography can be kind of spotty and inconsistent, or even repetitive and redundant. And even though God's Father might share some elements of that, and it's, it's a goddamn long mixtape, uh, th th there's just something so magical about this this tape. There's something so magical about it. It's a magical experience. It's a magical Base God experience. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. I wish I reviewed this at the time that it dropped. Just thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you, Base God. Thank you. Thank you, Base God. Thank you. 
Next, I want to say uh, that I regret not covering, as I said I would, uh, that new Autecker uh, sort of five L L L L Sec five part five hour album. I said I was gonna. I didn't end up making the time for it, mostly because it was it was five hours, and you know I, I wish I made that time. Does that mean you're gonna do the new one? It's even longer. It's longer than that one. You know, may, may, maybe no. Maybe, maybe no. Maybe I'm not gonna. Maybe I'm not gonna cover that one. And finally, I want to give a shout out to the Batushka album. Uh, Liturgia, I believe it's pronounced. So these guys are a Polish metal band. This is their debut full length album, which kind of rocked. Uh, the black metal and metal underground collectively with its amazing compositions, epic production, and fantastic, like, chanting vocals, uh, which are pretty powerful. Uh, maybe they lay a little too hard on them sometimes as, as a bit of a crutch, uh, but still, this is an excellently put-together black metal album that, in, in many respects, feels larger than life, but still keeps very close connections to the uh, genre's blasphemous, uh, dark, grimy, and evil roots. And um, yeah, it's just a, just a great underground metal, black metal rager uh, that, that I wish I uh, talked about in, 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 in length on the channel. And uh, I hope that uh, some of you, if, if you're not aware of some of these albums, uh, that you check them out yourselves. Uh, all of the records that I talked about in this video, uh, music to hear them is linked down below in the description. And uh, that, that's gonna be it. Transition, have you given these albums a listen? If you did, did you review them? Unlike me, being a dum dum, being a dum 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 head and not reviewing them. Um, yeah, Anthony Fantano over here next to my head is another video that you can check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel uh, forever.